Hi everyone, Jonathan here once more in a different location. This is our store of, among other things, staff weapons, which is what you can see around me. Uh, believe it or not, there are one or two that have guns built into them. We might come back to that one day. But right now, we're here to look at um, what's actually a very conventional firearm from one point of view. But it's today, to, to us today, very, well, it is very rare, de facto. There aren't many of them left in the world. And it's a type of, or a class of firearm, probably to be more accurate, that we don't really think about very much. You don't really see it in the movies. We don't really read about it very much. And that is the arquebus, or harquebus, if you prefer. It's basically the same word in, in all languages. Um, we believe it comes from the German Hackenbusch, or Buscher, meaning hook gun, because originally it had a hook on the front. You can see examples of the original uh, version of that here at Leeds in the main galleries. This is a very developed, or well, relatively developed, maybe 100 years on from its initial launch, as it were, version of the same idea. Now, you'd look at this and probably say musket. Uh, one time I would have called this a musket. What's the difference between an arquebus and a musket? It's a question of size and power. So, by the time this thing is made, and we'll get to the details on this in a moment, so 1540 is the rough date we've assigned to this. By 1540, the musket exists and is in use, in, uh, or at least with some of the army, armies of Europe, and it is a giant version of this. Now, before the musket was kind of classified as um, being of at least 70 caliber and fired from a rest with a huge powder charge, there were arquebuses of that size and power, but they weren't standardized. They weren't probably very common, much more common with a smaller, lighter, handier guns. So this is what I would think of as an arquebus. So we're, we're pretty happy with the date of this at 1540, that it is a effectively a lighter, a little brother to the, to the musket um, used by uh, arquebusiers, they're often called, or hack butters, because uh, hack butt was an English term for, for, these, for this gun, uh, hag butt you'll also come across, uh, hag, hag bush, all sorts of variations. They're like your light infantry, or, or forerunners of the light infantry. Not, not, not armoured particularly, they're very little in the way of armour, lightly equipped, doing more in the way of skirmishing type action. Now, musketeers are about putting a wall of lead in the direction of the enemy. These guys are a little bit more tactically flexible, but their weapons are not nearly so powerful or long range. That's, that's the key thing to bear in mind in terms of the, the practical use of this. This is actually from Italy, um, from uh, Gardoni in the north of Italy, in Brescia. And it's very, very high end, I think it's safe to say. So this is not a sort of custom piece for a gentleman or a king. It's, it's military but it's very nicely made, very precision made piece of kit. We have other examples. We have three of these in total. One of them is um, highly decorated. Another of them has a more elaborately carved stock. This is, this is the most workmanlike, the most military of, of the three that we possess. Um, so I'll just talk you through it quickly. So we've got at the front end, well, a sight, which is going to, going to become important. I'll show you the, the rear sight in a moment. An octagonal barrel, very, very precision made, hand made, hand drilled and reamed. A scouring stick is what it's called at this time, because it, it's the ramrod, or the rammer, but it also has these, this sprung scouring end for scouring out the fouling, because we're using a ball that closely fits the bore. Um, whether patched or not is not entirely clear. I suspect they would have used patches where possible, or at least for longer range shooting. So you get a buildup of carbon that you need to scrape out with that stick. I, I won't remove it from its housing, because it is this is very, very old, 500 years old, and extremely um, fragile. Very minimal decoration of just some um, incised lines on the, on the stock that carry on all the way to the end. The rear sight is absolutely fascinating because it's a hooded target style sight. Uh, it has vents in either side for the light to, to, to enter into, and of course a hole all the way through and it makes for a really, really precise sight picture. This, this blows brown bass out of the water, and that's a, that's a weapon from two centuries later. So the precision of the bore, the accuracy, 
and the precision uh, afforded by the site is way above what a later musketeer would have had access to. Then we have the lock mechanism, which is a sim at this time is a simple iron strap with a, a spring inside. So this is what's called a snap match lock or a snap lock, if you like. But we do need to specify match, I think, because this uh, this dog, or this is actually a dragon, I think, holds a burning piece of slow match. You have to replace that between shots. But technology wise, this is pretty sophisticated because it actually cocks like a flintlock. Most match locks worked against a spring or in a way that lowers the match into the pan, the pan being here with your priming powder to, to fire it off with a pivoting cover to cover it up. But this snapping lock, um, now the spring on this one has gone unfortunately, but normally or originally when I pulled this trigger that would snap forward a short distance. Really quite high tech this thing. If we look at um, period artwork, we see an awful lot of cheek stocking. So you just literally hold it to your cheek and fire. And the recoil on this, it's a um, relatively small caliber, relatively small powder charge, certainly compared to a musket, and you can fire this off the cheek. You could pull it into the shoulder or rest it on top of, or part, you know, you can fire it like that quite comfortably. Uh, we have a very good reproduction of this that I've fired a few times, and modern people, we tend to shoulder the thing. But uh, in terms of period, actually, putting your cheek on it and maybe resting it on top of the shoulder was probably how it was done. So uh, an amazing piece. Uh, we're very lucky to have, never mind one, but three of these things. Um, so we know from historical records that 1,500 of these, which is not insignificant for, um, for an English army of, the, of, the 50, of 1540, because the English army didn't have much in the way of gunners in it, uh, hand gunners, we know that 1500 were sold uh, by the uh, Republic of Venice to King Henry VIII or to his armed forces. So these equipped part of King Henry's army, or one of his armies. Pieces of, of these were found on the Merry Rose. So he was clearly using them. It's pretty fascinating. And this was a broad type that was, would have been used across Europe by all sorts of different people. And that manufacturing hub in Brescia, in Gardoni, specifically the town of Gardoni, is still active. Absolutely astonishingly, 500 years later, there is still, notably Beretta, um, world famous, massive firearms company, Beretta, still going, owned by the same family, founded in the 1520s by Bartolomeo Beretta, became Pietro Beretta later on. They're still going, uh, making, well, the modern equivalent to this. So like something like the uh, ARX-160 assault rifle, 5.56 millimeter. It's not so different. The weight's not so far off. This is three and a half kilos. That's probably about the same weight. That's a lot shorter because shorter barrels are, are the trend these days. And of course it has a 30 round magazine and 700 rounds per minute. This has no magazine and one round, well, Maybe, maybe two, three rounds a minute. But this is where it all started 500 years before that. We don't have the maker of this, unfortunately. Um, we're pretty sure it's not Beretta because the marking on the bottom of this barrel is LO. Uh, so that, that it's hard to connect that to, to Beretta, as, as lovely as that would be, uh, for that continuity of uh, firearms history and I suppose corporate history. So yes, this for me, this is one of the earliest truly recognizable infantry shoulder weapons, if we can put it that way. There were, there were guns before this for a hundred odd years, but it's only in the first uh, few decades of the 16th century that they become technologically advanced enough to be really useful and strategically, or at least tactically significant uh, at battles like Pavia, which we have a, a, a diorama of in our gallery here in Leeds for a reason. It's one of the instances where guys with guns were able to take down armored men-at-arms on horses. Thank you for watching, we really appreciate it. It's the most important thing other than visiting our real world museum sites of which we have three and we'd be very grateful if you come and see us there as well. But you can go and check us out over on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And there is a, a long running at this point quiz effectively that 
dovetails nicely into this series of videos. You can enjoy them standalone, but you might find it fun to guess what it is that we're going to be talking about ahead of time. Um, either way, we'll see you again next time. Thanks again.